This is a paper about cross-collaboration between two countries and how that affects American television. And everybody's been kind of shocked when I've mentioned that at lunch or breakfast along the week. Because if you're not here, you don't realize how much Doctor Who has encroached in America and how it is, I believe, changing some of the things that do in American television, particularly the way that we will in the future represent race on television, which has not been done very well in America and is being done brilliantly by Russell T. Davies, um, who I give much credit for. In fact, my kind of thesis behind all of this is words make a difference and words join cultures together and this man's words have had a great impact in this country even though people don't realize that. So first of all we have to talk about what is Doctor Who, right? Doctor Who started in 1963. It's a 50 year running television program. And the reason I like to use it in my one hour drama television classes and critical studies classes is it highlights a thing that I'm really big on which is authorship. Authorship in television and film belongs to the screenwriter. I don't care about directors. I don't care how they hold cameras. That my great story I tell students is Robert Riskin's favorite line about Frank Capra's touch. He once handed in 200 blank pages and said, put your fucking touch on that. <laughs> so it is about screenwriters. And the show is about the power of screenwriters because in 1960, they started the show with this actor, William Hartnell. It's about a traveling alien who goes through time and space, and we learn history from him. Hartnell got sick a few years later, and the show would have gone away because your lead actor had to go away. And a writer, but they can't remember which one on the staff at the time, thought, wait a minute, our character is an alien. Suppose instead of the way humans die, this guy, when he gets damaged or hurt, regenerates and becomes an entirely different physical being. What a great idea. We can change actors over and over again. Anytime they get too egotistical, or they want to leave. And it has now happened some 11 times, and they just announced a new guy, which I'll mention in a moment. So, this was all happening in the years of the beginning of Doctor Who. It had a little break where it was canceled, and it was brought back again, again, the power of a writer, by this guy, Russell T. Davies, who was uh, writing high off of Queerest Book, which he'd invented in the UK. And they said, you can do anything you want. And he said, I want to regenerate Doctor Who, this show of my childhood. And they let him do it. And what he brought to the show is a modern sensibility. Of course, he had modern production money, which was good for him. But the things that he brought to it as a outed gay man in the UK, I think are very interesting for Americans because he talks about watching television and how bad it is to see certain things. And I'm going to talk about that when I get to his second show, his spinoff, which is Torchwood. Um, as far as Doctor Who's concerned, we can see it encroach into America because when they came up with the Matt Smith character, suddenly these billboards appeared in Los Angeles. Billboards for a British show that would air on BBC America, as you see, not obviously BBC. Um, it is true that many people actually got the series through a thing we all know that we don't admit called BitTorrent uh, because they wanted desperately to see it. So BBC America began a new thing, first of all, advertising to Americans. Second of all, airing on the same day in this country that it aired in the UK. That had not happened before. When, I mean, I watched Doctor Who in the 70s, and it was Tom Baker, and he was already retired from the show. Now we were getting them two weeks later, and that still seemed like not enough. With Twitter, the digital world where people want to share stories, we had to see it at least on the same day, right? So that was a big deal. Then slowly you saw the encroachment of toys in American toy stores, toys that came from a British television show. And yes, this is my sonic screwdriver. It's mine. It's not my 15-year-old son's. Um, but these types of things began appearing all over the place. And this had never happened with a show from any other country. I mean, now I have students who watch Japanese anime and things they can get access to on the internet. It's really changing our sensibilities. But we learn from other cultures. Um, it also began to encroach into late night television. This is Colin Ferguson with a Dalek, which is Dylan on the show. Uh, it's because he's a, a Scotsman and in the States and he loved the show so much. He began to have actors on an English program on an American late night show. So you really had to be an insider to understand who these people were and why they were being given guest star spots. I'm essentially, you know, another version of David Letterman. That's a big deal. Then, of course, he, we're seeing cross-cultural actors go back and forth. Alex Kingston had actually come to the States and she'd been in ER, so everyone thought she was American, but she's actually not. And she showed up on Doctor Who, and that was a big deal. As did John Barrowman, who was born in the UK, raised here until he was 10, then went back to begin his acting career. He played a character named Captain Jack. So all these 
actors are crossing around, and then he ended up doing Desperate Housewives. So we're seeing his his celebrity from one show can be parlayed into work in American television. It's a big deal. Anyway. One of the things that I think that Russell D. Tavies has helped us change is our looking at race in America. Uh, Lindy Orthia, out of the National uh, University in Australia, put together this collection that just came out that I have an essay in called um, When White Boys Write Black. And it's about how these two writers, Tavies and Moffat, who I'll show you in a second, dealt with race. But when she put out a call for race, what I learned from doing it was how my opinion of race is so Americanized. And I learned so much about the global concept through this contribution. Immediately, my brain from Cleveland, Ohio, went to black and white. That's race. That's how Americans generally see race. And then I saw the other contributors talking about, of course, how Asians are represented on the program and all these other colonization and what that has to do with you know, the world. Peter Davison is a doctor who wore a little cricket outfit. There's a whole discussion on how that represented the beauty of colonization and all this sort of thing. So I kind of laughed at that. But I learned a lot from this particular piece, and I think we learned a lot from how these two men, this is Stephen Moffat, who then took over the show, have represented race on the show. And the difference is Russell T. Davies, whether that's because he's a better writer or because he happens to be uh, a gay man, a minority of, in his own right, um, presented three characters of African descent, a phrase I had to learn to say because I couldn't call them African American because they're not from America. So that was very confusing to Americans. What do you call someone who's of African descent? Uh, he invented three characters. This guy, Mickey, who was one of the first uh, companion characters of color who was in an interracial relationship. And American television doesn't show that without letting it be the main reason for the story. This is a black and white couple, and there's a problem. In all of Davies' television, even going back to Queer's Folk, black and white couples, the issues were never about their race, which is a new story for Americans to soak in. Um, he also, Davies, invented the first African-American hmm? companion of African descent, uh, Martha Jones. That's a big deal. And uh, this character, Rita, uh, appeared, Rosita, appeared in an earlier episode. So he's doing very good work, and he's doing three-dimensional work with characters of color. And this is something that American television is really only now just addressing. It used to be you had your token black friend. Right? Nowadays, you don't even have a token black friend anymore. You have your token Indian friend. Because for sad reasons in America, Indians are the better friend of color because Indians are educated and smart. And so we like them better. And once you put an Indian character in the cast, for instance, Big Bang Theory, <laughs> guess what? You don't need to have a black character. So it's an interesting look at how we are not dealing with both bricks. Um, anyway, my whole essay very briefly, because it's not close to this exactly, but Davies' three characters all had sexual lives, they had religions, they had a whole three-dimensional personality. Moffat, sadly, made tokens. It shocked me. And I don't want to say it's because he's a white boy and he has no minority in his life, but apparently there's a reason why all three of his characters... This is Liz Ten, a futuristic queen of England who happens to be of African descent. But she only shows up in one ep two episodes, helps out the plot line, and disappears. There's no building of this character in any interesting fashion. Likewise, this character doesn't build very much either, but she looks really great on screen. <laughs> shows up in one episode, and she's gone, um, as does this woman, who is not only a person of color, but also a person of another religion, or one that has not been largely uh, shown on American television, of course, it's Islam, and she ends up dying at the end of her episode. So it's not a very big arc for that character. So watching these two men deal with um, race, I think has been very interesting and is beginning to be reflected in American television. We all know about Grey's Anatomy and Shonda Rhimes putting that forward. She argues that she can do this because the BBC requires colorblind casting. American television doesn't require it. So she required it on her series, using the BBC as her excuse. Other people do it, so can I. People thought she was being racist by not wanting to have different you know, white actors do certain parts. So she's relying on this sort of history. Um, the other thing I love about Russell D. Davies is he said, it may be terrible to watch television with families who are of African descent or families who have gay members. It's awful to watch television with women because women treats, television treats women so badly. So he invented his spin-off show called Torchwood that stars uh, Eve Miles. And she plays a character named Gwen. She's a detective. And he purposefully flipped the relationship. She's a detective who works for an X-Files type. They, they solve crimes involving aliens. 
and her husband's a truck driver. And he stays home and makes dinner and complains when she comes home from work late. And he purposefully turned that marriage on a dime to show that relationship and to show a man who believes and supports his wife, which you wouldn't think feminist men were that hard to show on television. Apparently they are in America because we ain't got too many of them. <laughs> so all of this stuff is moving through and affecting things. Uh, we just put out a book, I have a chapter in called Torture Being Classified, which looks at why this show stands out. And a lot of this comes from the cross-cultural collaboration, looking at how we deal with authority in both countries, the UK and the United States. Um, and when they came to America for the fourth season of Torchwood, and this was a big dream of Russell T. Davies to work in American television, to which I got the chance to interview him for Written by a Magazine, which is a magazine with Writers Guild. Um, and I said, why did you do that? He said, because it's like still this dream to come here and do TV. He said, no, no, your TV is much better than ours. Stay. Stay home. Make good TV that I can steal in Victoria. Uh, came to the States, he hired Doris Egan and Jane Aspenson. Jane Aspenson, Doris Egan is from House. Jane Aspenson is largely a cult loved TV writer from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So she's got her own blog on writing. They both did the fourth season, which was called Toward, Toward Miracle Day. And in doing that series, um, they talked about what they learned working with writers. And we think there shouldn't be that much difference between our two cultures, right? We sort of all look alike and sort of we come from a similar background. And yet they discovered many things that were different from the process of writing television to just the average everyday. Uh, one of Jane Espenson's funny stories that she told at Gallifrey One, which is another example of the encroachment of Doctor Who, because this convention when I went to it in the 1980s had like 40 people, and now you're waiting in line two hours to see people present. <laughs> so the idea of the growth of that. Uh, she told a story about sitting in the writer's room, and they had a discussion over a vest. And apparently, in America, in this, a vest is the third piece of a suit. But when they said that, Russell Davis said, no, that's a waistcoat. And so he began to describe what was a vest to him, which was a white t-shirt with no sleeves. And Jane Espenson said, oh, that's a wife beater. And he stopped and said, oh my god, who would wear a piece of clothing with that name? And yet we use that name all the time in America, and we just let it wife beater. Oh, sure, put one on, that's good for you. I mean, it's kind of like in a British room, we say we're going to gangbang script. And then one day we stopped and went, oh my god, I have to stop saying that word out loud. I'm a woman, why am I offering to gangbang anything? But again, power of language. And having him question it made the women think about why am I using this word, maybe America would think about it. Um, yeah. Oh, and the other one was he, he um, was shocked. They were tracing Diablo Cody's career, and she became famous for writing her blog called Candy stripping, and he wondered what candy stripers actually did in hospitals. <laughs> Apparently they don't have candy stripers in So all of this blending of culture, all this blending of language, it helped them put together a product, but also the English writers who came here with Davies had to get off their rose-colored glasses about how brilliant American TV was, when they realized in the room their process, they felt, and I tend to agree, was more creative. American writing rooms like to have everything nailed down before you send the writer home to write. I've given a great piece of dialogue and this guy said exactly what will happen and, this, and all of that. And Davies thought that was far too formulaic. He wanted to leave the writers the opening to, here's the sketch of what you're going to do in that scene. What else might you bring to it at four in the morning when your creativity kicks in? And you went, so they had a little arguing over how the process would be. Of course, he was the executive producer, so he won, which was good for him. And it led to the other writers, the American writers, Egan and Espenson, admitting that they didn't like the constraints under which they had written in the past, and they enjoyed this more creative outlet that was being provided to them. So I think that's an excellent lesson for American writers as well. Um, all right, the other ways I wanted to note that Doctor Who has truly changed the way we're dealing with television from other countries. Three years ago was the first year they ever aired their Christmas special on the exact on the day of Christmas, which had never happened. We would always wait a week because we thought no one in America would watch TV on Christmas night. The show got killer ratings for BBC in America. So beginning with that, they started to see that we had to put this together. And just about a month ago, when they were announcing the next actor to play the Doctor, they live simulcast a half an hour program that introduced this new actor. Live. So we watched it at 11 while it was being aired at 8 o'clock at night in England. They weren't going to even make the eight hour wait because they knew the minute they announced it in England, Twitter, 
digital world, everybody here would know, and there'd be no ratings for this particular episode. Instead, it got, again, killer ratings for BBC in America. They announced this gentleman, Peter Capaldi, who'd become famous here for the uh, third season of Torchwood, and so he was known through the who universe, as we call it. Um, the next thing that you see the change coming in is the show that's just now airing on Stars, The White Queen, um, that comes to us from BBC and Stars. That's the, the production group that put together Torchwood Miracle Day, that fourth season. So they tried to draw that into America through Stars, which of course required a lot more bare butts and sex scenes and that sort of thing, <laughs> which is kind of fun. Um, so now we're seeing The White Queen in this fashion, and the DVD actually is already out uh, just two days ago because of that popularity as well as we are going to have Broadchurch on IT very quickly. Um, the thing that I think we will finally learn, the habit Americans have to break, which global television and the access we now have to it, it will allow us to break, is sadly, just after they announced that this would appear here in America, BBC America bought it from ITV to air here. The Fox Network aired that we were going to remake it with American actors which I think is a big mistake, considering the killing and anything else. Yes, we can make a nice copy of it, but nowadays we have access to the original. We don't need the copy. And I think that's the new thing Americans have to learn. That's the step we have not yet taken when it comes to cross-culturally thinking about other creative pieces. And I'm really hoping that this will be the last American remake we need to see, partially because David Tennant, through having played Doctor Who, has enough of a reputation here not to need to be replaced. People will know who did the part first. We now will have this recognition of these actors that wasn't available to us before, which I think will have to change the way we consider these things. Uh, anyway, so in my opinion, it is words that have crossed cultures and helped us learn about this product of television that we clearly enjoy across many cultures. And I really think Russell Davies' words have had a huge impact, certainly a huger impact than any other previous piece of television. I'm waiting for the first Japanese show to break into American television. The first Israeli show. We did it in treatment a few years ago, but that was our remake of that program. Right? So we know that there's good quality product out there, and we have to stop essentially colonizing it and making it our own, because it's not. Um, and I think that's what's missing. So that's my story. And then I'm going to go off and do my next book, which is called The Metatextual Menagerie That Was the Monkeys. It's all about the groundbreakingness of political culture of that program. Because as much as I enjoy watching John Barrowman a lot to study Torchwood, I really like watching Mickey Dolan. <laughs> <laughs>